All right, this week's episode of Magnify, we're joined for a record-breaking third time by Kurt Euler. How are we doing, sir? I'm doing great. So, what have you been up to? Um, it's been a little while since we chatted. How how things been? Yeah, I think things have been great. They've been uh, quite exciting. I mean, I think we're going to talk a little bit about how exciting it's been in real estate. But uh, yeah, I've uh, I've jumped in with a few additional companies. Um, I'm uh, one of those. I think we may come up in our conversation. I'm talking with, or I'm working with uh, Easy Home Search, so building another national portal, um, competitors at Realty.com and uh, Zillow and Shulia, Redfin's uh, portal. Uh, so that's been kind of quite exciting to be have a lot of time talking with agents and brokers across, gosh, probably 50 different uh, brokerages and teams in the last couple of months. Yeah, you know, one of the things I love talking to you about real estate, um, and one of the reasons I love talking to you about real estate is just the background that you bring from other industries and coming with with that kind of, that kind of lens on on the business in general. Um, we're going to talk about the the NAR settlement because it is very topical. Um, want to get your thoughts on that? But in general, where do you see real estate in twenty twenty four? We're a quarter of the way in. Where are the opportunities for agents? What are you hearing from all the conversations you're having with agents? You know, in terms of what they think is going on. Yeah. It depends on who you talk to. Um, for real estate as a whole, uh, I, I think there's still a tremendous opportunity and probably a better opportunity for the agents that will stay in real estate than, um, than there almost ever has been. Uh, with that, when I talk to a lot of agents, uh, there is huge amounts of uncertainty both with agents, whether buyers, agents, sellers, agents, and consumers. Like uncertainty across the board. The media has not been kind for explaining uh, the NAR settlement and what's happening uh, to consumers. It's going to, I think, frankly, the confusion is going to hurt a lot of consumers over the next, like, probably five to 10 years. Yeah. But agents, so many agents are uncertain. And I mean, I'm already seeing, I've talked to some of the mass brokerages. I'm looking at numbers. I mean, I think we've probably seen 20 to maybe even as high as 30% of agents as an agent count drop out of being real estate. It's very similar to the crash we saw before. But I think that's a really good thing. Um, and I think it's going to be actually a really good thing for the agents that stay and for consumers as a whole. I mean, I would never go get my wisdom tooth done by somebody who said, even if they were a dentist, said, I think I did one of those about six months ago, or I do two or three a year. But but that's what like the almost like million licensed agents, whether they're realtors or not in the US, that's what a part-time agent kind of is. And there's nothing wrong with getting started and moving in. But these part-time agents, I think a lot of them have already dropped out. And I think that's increasingly, it's going to be forced that direction because buyer's agents are going to get paid. They should get paid, but they're going to have to explain their value. And so if you did three transactions last year or zero versus somebody that did 35 or 70 well, that's going to become very clear. Consumers are going to force that conversation going soon, going very soon. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, Craig Rowe, who's an, an Inman uh, journalist, we actually had him on here a few months back. He left a comment on, I think it was Brad Inman who actually posted it on LinkedIn, and I, I thought it was actually the best comment I've seen you know, on social about it. He just said, "Whoever serves the consumer best is going to win." And people need to remember that in this industry. And I think that really was was eye opening in the sense that agents are kind of thinking about themselves in this in this instance, at least what I'm kind of hearing and seeing from different conversations, versus thinking about okay, how can how can I now go and serve the consumers and earn that commission? You know, so yeah, very much so. I mean, I, a lot of top performing, um, at least on the buyer side, a lot of the top performing agents. Um, in any market that you look at, if you go listen to, if you were able to sit in like I've been able to in some of their um, listing presentations, even if they have somebody on a team that's doing the initial pitch, and you listen to somebody from five years ago that was a top performing uh, buyer's agent in Georgia, um, and, and you listen to how they spoke to an agent, that's, that's where everybody's going to be pushed going forward. Those people five years ago, 10 years ago, would have encouraged every potential buyer that they're working with to say, you should go talk to two more agents. This is why I'm really good. I focus on people just like you. Here's my background. Here's what I do. And here's the complexities I can solve you with, uh, I can help you with. That, that conversation happened for top performers before. And the industry, and really what I mean the industry, that both the brokers and agents hadn't pushed it, but consumers hadn't demanded it before. The top performing agents just knew to sell their value. Everything's going to be pushed that way going very quickly. 
Do you see there being a, uh, a change in how agents acquire business now? Um, you know, we have, we have the pillars of working your sphere, generating leads, referral leads. Do you see any changes in that with, with the potential settlement uh, being put into place? Yeah, great question. Maybe. And I just say maybe. Um, I think the the higher performing agents, I mean, full time professional agents, people that are earning, you know, take home one hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand a year. They had most of them had a diverse, a diverse source of where they were getting leads from, where they were getting new clients from. There was sphere, um, but there, there there was referrals for sure. And then there were lead gen sources. Um, I mean, I mentioned I'm, I'm, I'm chief marketing officer for Easy Home Search right now. They're partnering with exclusively on a county basis across the country, individual agents or mortgage teams or brokers for all of the leads that come through through, say, Boom County. I'm in Union County, George, right now. So all the leads that come through Union County would flow through a single vetted partner for them to work. Well, of course, there's a cost for that, but there's a huge value for the leads on that side. It's almost a partner relationship. Well, that's, yeah. that's what better agents have, have always done. They've gone to insurance brokers, fee-based financial advisors. They've gone to people that are serving homeowners and people in different ways and said, hey, here's how I can help your clients work better. Because it's very different working with somebody who's, who's flipping a house. And so they've got, a, they've got an equity partner in the background um, and, and lawyers in the background. Very different than a, a, somebody who owns a single home or buying a first-time home. And so like they have those partners. Um, With that, I I do think so many agents to their detriment have focused on pay-per-click and ads in the past. Um, And I say to their detriment because content marketing has always been – organic search results have always been the the best driver for – the higher quality leads and huge values. Um, Showcase has a customer, Patrick Higgins in Nashville. Um, Patrick's always been great at this. He creates content, gets organic search. There's an implicit trust when he shows up first, second, or third in Google. That's this, that type of work is the content selling your value that people are going to have to start doing when they talk. And so I, I, I'm hoping more agents will start doing that from their websites, from their social media. And so those that like have already started a website, started a, even – if you have a YouTube channel that you've claimed, you're ahead of 99% of agents out there. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean let's get into some some tactical stuff. Where – where sh- where do you think agents should be focusing on in terms of the content marketing? What are, what are the main uh, content sources that that they should focus on, if any? Uh, for I think for me, websites and around area based guides. So you're usually not working all of Georgia, all of North Georgia. You're working a smaller area. Like I'm, I mentioned, I'm in Blairsville and Union County right now. So you might actually work Union County because I mean it's a rather rural area. You should have pages on your website that detail what you know and what people should know about moving here. It's very different than a suburb of Atlanta or Nashville. And so anytime you talk to a client that's moving here and you explain that, well, record yourself and go put it on a page in your website or buy why um, this part of Blairsville. I, I live in an area close to a shop that's kind of fun and eclectic called Alexander Store. Everybody for like five counties, any direction, know about it. Well, Living near Alexander's is different than living closer to in town or on the other side of Blairsville. Well, you should have a page that's, that, that describes that and the track rock area here. Um, so that type of content marketing is a huge bit that agents could do and should do. And they're speaking about it already. They just have to put words on a screen. And when they do that, now Google cares about it. And you have something as a follow-up when you talk to clients that reinstills everything you just told them. So it makes your value go that much higher. So I, that's a huge bit for me because you can use an email, you can get rank on Google, you can use, as I mentioned, in follow-ups. The second bit for me would be um, YouTube, Facebook, video across the board. I don't care whether it's TikTok, just whatever you're using right now, don't go start another social network if you're not already on it. It needs to be where you're at already. And don't try to be like the big influencer that's defining the market trends. You can do that. All I want you to do, I think the best thing, the lowest hanging fruit is you talk to clients at least a couple times a week. As soon as you get off the phone or you stop from showing homes and a topic comes up, take out your camera and just anonymize it just enough and talk through in a story 
the conversation you just had. If you're talking with somebody who is working their way out of debt and trying to buy their, their first home, well, that's a story that people will connect with. If you're talking to somebody, um, a mortgage broker in uh, Roswell uh, did, did this story. He was talking with somebody when he asked, give me your last three addresses over the last 10 years. Guy said, here's my address right now. I'm like three months out of prison. I've been in jail. Um, he'd been working through, he was debt free by that point for things. And so he, a guy who'd been working through the things, had a solid job work, you know, basically living in a halfway house, but changing his life. Wow. Heart tugging from the story because he's wanting to help this guy had already been turned by, down by two banks because he didn't have past addresses. And so like no. that without telling the client's information, that story had me listen to like a 11 or 15 minute video. That's a, you have those conversations every day. You don't have to think about what to say. Just as soon as you get done talking to the client, don't worry about how you look. Just take out your camera and record it. Like you're talking to somebody about that story. You're telling your wife, your husband about that story and put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook and your, your lead gen will go up. Yeah. I love that. And it, it kind of ties into what I was going to ask you next about you know, I'm listening to uh, Ryan Serhan's book, uh, branded like Serhan at the moment. And, you know, obviously it's in the title, but I, th I think, and it's definitely how I feel agents need to start looking at themselves is you're a personal brand. People are, are going to, you have to present your value that much more now. And it's, it's about what people see of you before they even meet you. That's really going to sell them on you. So what are some tips you can give people outside of what you just mentioned um, that can help them build the, build their brand, establish their brand? Who are the people maybe they should be partnering with and selling themselves to not just uh, consumers, but other, you know, like you mentioned lenders and things like that. First of all, be yourself. Do not try to be another personality. Um, I'm a big fan. I've done training uh, with a, a well-known public speaker uh, named uh, Vin, Vin Yang. Vin's thing is like, don't ever try to mimic somebody else. But, but if you do have three, four, five people that you really enjoy, um, their YouTube, their podcast, by all means, borrow from some of that. But take the three to five people, merge it together and so that it's your own flavor. Yeah. It's okay to do that. Just don't try to become Gary Vaynerchuk. Do not be Grant Cardone. Be yourself and then perhaps try to bring in a little bit of change from, from how other people talk. So that's, that's the first thing. You'll feel much more comfortable rather than putting on a persona. Um, I think it scares a lot of people when, when they hear you're your own brand. I love Gary Vaynerchuk's approach about it says, hey, like act like you're a media company. Well, well that's true. Yeah. That scares people too. I, I think the key thing for most agents is – just be yourself. However you talk to clients today, however you would talk to somebody and say, this is why you're different than other agents, that's, that's your brand. And so whether you realize it or not, it doesn't have to be big terms. Be that person and just be it on camera and then interact with them. There's nothing wrong with being the, top, the type A, very short, curt um, asshole. Like that's some agents. That's who you are. You're a hard driver. You don't have a, a lot of emotional EQ, but you're the, you work well with investors and you're just take it, leave it type of, yeah. here's what you need to know. Be that person. If instead you're the counseling person that says, Hey, you're moving up to North Georgia. It's very different than the city life. And let me talk to you about that. And do you want to do a homestead? Or are you looking for a farm or a, a second property? Be that counselor. And so that's, that's probably the biggest thing I think is how you show up. Um, I think the other part for me is you mentioned like partners and who to work with. I mean, I mentioned agents have just an unlimited amount of topics. They don't have to plan ahead or in, if you don't want to take out your camera right then, like I literally have a note, uh, one of the notes on my iPhone that doesn't sync anywhere else. And just when I have an idea, I just add it to articles or topics to do so that you can get a bank of those going forward. But you could do, you could do two videos a week if you wanted to, um, every time the season changes by just, look, you've got a local electrician. And so schedule time with them, tell them that you have an audience and just do a Zoom recording with them that says, hey, it's becoming fall. What should somebody think about for their house? And, yeah. and, and interview them for 12 minutes and just ask questions. Hey, you do landscaping. You do hard landscaping. So bulldozers and skid steers. Uh, can I ask you some questions about that? And, and talk with the person about it and don't even have to edit it. Just interview them and asking them about their life or what somebody needs to know and then put that out. 
That's content. That's a, that's how to partner with people without even realizing it. Uh, we had this wonderful gentleman that put gutters on our house here uh, two or three years ago. Man, not only was did he just do impeccable service, he was easy to work with. While he was working, I went out and talked with him, and he I was having some erosion issues, which is why I was getting gutters put in. He he guided me through his thoughts about some of the erosion things I could do outside of gutters around the house. Hugely valuable to talk through. If that conversation would have been recorded, if I was an agent and I put it up on YouTube, put it up on Facebook and sent him an email and said, hey, just wanted you to know I put, that, put up our conversation. Here's what it looked like. I guarantee he would have posted it, shared it in the personal profile, and he happens to have an email list, so he would have sent it out as well. That's what partnering looks like. It, it doesn't have to be complicated. What do you think um, agents, sh- you know, as I mentioned, you've got to provide more value now up front. But I can see a world where people take that the wrong way and try and sell themselves a bit too much, you know, oversell. What kind of things can agents uh, provide consumers or potential customers, clients um, that's going to help them in the in the in that long run? Yeah, great question. I, I mean, I'm not sure people have to sell themselves that much up front. Like, don't be salesy. Like, right, if right, you're right. an agent and you work here and you know this area. You're an expert in this. Er- in this, you you may have just gone through a transaction that was very difficult for whatever reasons, especially with some of the with the, how broker uh, our buyers agents are going to be compensated. We don't know what's going to happen with VA loans and, and 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 some of the types of loans. Well, when you're working through those now, you sell yourself by just talking through. Here's the complexities we just have. Hey, if, if you're a veteran and you're working on a VA loan, while this is being figured out, here's the questions that just came up. I'd rather talk with you before you find your next home that you love. Let's talk. Like then I'm, I'm not selling myself. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm offering guidance about something that I'm an expert on, or I'm figuring out on your behalf. Um, other than that, I think the, the biggest part is just like, so there is that value, but I think it's, it's not trying to sell yourself. It's just trying to sell what you know. Yeah. And, and, and have conversations with people about what they know. Um, I mean, there is a little bit of selling yourself. I mean, if you're a buyer's agent and you've, even if you've done really well in the past, well, things are changing. If, you've, if you have not had a conversation regularly or with every client that explains the value of a buyer's agent, well, start practicing. Like that's, that's, that's going to, you're going to need it for every conversation, but if you record it once, you can u- now use it as a follow-up to send back out to people. So that is selling your value a little bit, but I, I don't think there's that much of, you need to give, uh, like, I'm not selling myself to you if I'm the agent about like too much ahead of time, any different than I would offering guidance that might be applicable to you, but would be applicable to 2000 other people just like you. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I see a lot of agents and, and I, I, post this kind of content too, just that kind of market data. Uh, here's what's happening in this area or that area. How important mm-hmm. do you think that is? Or do you think agents would, would be better served trying to, you know, spending their time on making those connections and, and providing more of an individualized, uh, for lack of a better term, holistic uh, conversation versus just his, his data. I know what I'm talking about kind of, kind of thing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing market reports or what's changing yeah. in the market or what people are seeing. That just, that doesn't need to be the core of what you offer. It may be something that yeah. you do consistently once every two weeks, if things are really changing once a month or something, I could see that. But do you need an every week report out there? I, I not in my opinion um, for most of these things with that said, there's nothing wrong with, actually having that conversation as part of these partners you're talking with. If you're, if you're talk, if you have one or two mortgage partners you talk with and you know, every time, every once a quarter, when you bring one of them on to ask them what's going on, well, you should generally ask them, what are they seeing in the market? Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very solid with the uh, companies that I work with right now, but I, you know, I had a conversation yesterday for like an hour and 10 minutes with uh, the head of a retained search for a very large uh, company in the world. And so he leads their U.S. business. Like as part of that hour and 15 minute just conversation, not recorded, just private conversation, he asked me what I was seeing because he knows I talk to a lot of CEOs and private equity groups. And I asked him, um, he was kind of already going that direction, what is he hearing from the companies that he's talking about? That's part of sharing information back and forth. Right. Um, our, me and him sharing information, that might have been useful actually to kind of 
make public if, if we had planned on it. So there, that's not that it's unvaluable. It's just do things change? Yes. Um, I mean, he, he started by saying it is very much a candidate's market right now. You're a top performer. You're a top 1% person. Kurt, you can name your price and terms and flexibility, any company you want to work with right now. I already knew that, but it's still good to hear from him. Yeah. So if it shifts from a buyer's market with real estate to a seller's market, I mean, that's something to let people know and let them know what that means because agents know, but most consumers don't know what that means. Yeah. Well, that's actually an interesting thought, right? That I think a lot of agents, um, while they could be and, and should be the the authority on real estate and what's going on in the area, I think there's nothing wrong with kind of being open to having discussions with people around. And I think it would facilitate more conversations of, Hey, what are you hearing in town? Instead right. of, you know, I know everything. I think, I think that would be a great approach. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I love that. I think for agents, so much of it would be content marketing is always hard. I mean, just, it's hard for people to get started with it. It shouldn't be, but um, it is. And so the other people that are serving your potential clients, you mentioned lawyers, insurance people, mortgage, uh, landscapers, they're not doing this work. And so if you just decide to start having conversations with them, just of the five that I just mentioned, well, if you just did one of those every week, you've, you've got five videos to put out over the next time. And just to talk to a fee-based planner and say, Hey, it's the end of the year. What advice would you, what advice would you have? You could just send something out to all your clients right now, or what are people contacting you about? Well, that would be good to know. Um, mm -hmm. And to, to let people know what they're hearing. Um, I mean, the, if you ask the fee-based planner right now, they'd probably tell you the same thing I mentioned to that retained search person yesterday. He asked me what I was hearing. The first thing I said is almost every CEO, C-level executive or private equity group I talk to is completely uncertain about what's happening, what's going to be happening. Some are in a state of fear. They're so uncertain, but most are just not sure. And like, well, that's good to know. For, from him because his business is a yeah. retained search. As a as an employee, that would be really good for your clients to know, Mr. and Mrs. Agent. So if they're talking to fee-based planner and say, well, this is what they're seeing. Well, should, should should people be going out and buying a buying an extra, you know, vanity car right now? Well, probably not. So like just letting that be yeah. part of a conversation that takes place. Yeah. Um I and I think a lot of what's happened, and I think really this settlement talk has been a bit of a wake-up call to the industry in general that agents had it good for a good few years where you didn't really have to work hard. You just – if there were clients who wanted to buy homes, you had multiple offers on houses, so you didn't have to really market it. Buyers are really hungry. I think now we've come back to, oh, I need to really maintain and build relationships like we used to. There was one thing you said on a, a webinar with uh, Asian Hub 360 about uh, it was one of your kids' birthdays. I forget which one. Mm. And a, an agent or two that had, you'd work with the EXP had reached out, said happy birthday. And I think one of them maybe had put it on their calendar from the prior year when you posted something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any other I, I, I thought that was great. I pride myself on being good at building relationships is what I do. But that was like, oh, that's such a good, a good practice. And I've started doing that now. Are there any other things you, you know, with the amount of agents you've spoken to that you've come across a, a kind of like some great tactics like that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I, in that case, you know, that was based on my daughter's birthday. I, I, Here's your reminder. <laughs> <laughs> got my echo going off for a reminder to start our dishwasher up here. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. So it may uh, it may trigger one more time for us right here. Here's we'll get past reminder. that. Well, there you that's a, use Alexa. It's a good good for reminders. Yeah. Remind me. Well, next and year so that, for... that's kind of the thing. So um, I'd say one th those tips like where the agent put in my uh, my daughter's birth, and so they use that as a trigger to respond back. Um, use technology to your advantage. Like examples like that are going to come up. Whatever. So what I don't know is was the agent in front of their CRM when 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 that event triggered or. People that work for me often know, can tell when I've been on a long drive because I'm listening to audiobooks and podcasts. And so I usually, I don't use normal reminders on my Apple Watch. I use it to capture those ideas because that's the easiest way to do it. And so I'll set a reminder, uh, I'll set a whole bunch of reminders for things that I want to give to people on my team. And then I'll come back to the reminders and I'll use that to input in 
to-do yeah. list and a Trello or send out emails. So when you're out with a client, when something triggers you, you're at church and somebody mentions something and you step aside and say, hey, set a reminder that Paulo is blah, 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 blah. Then use that technology reminder to come back to you to add the reminders in your CRM. So that's another really good tactical tip there. For me, I think the other thing would be, it's when I go talk to agents, I mean, I want you to use your CRM. Um, you're going to get scared as a normal agent hearing this and be like, oh, Kurt's telling me to use more technology. Because most agents, I'll just let you know a secret, they're not using their CRM. They claim they have a CRM. They've got a KV Core account their brokerage gave, it gave them. Um, they're, they're, using, uh, they're using something else. They're using Fallout Boss. And they think that they have a, they're using drip campaigns because somebody signs up for an IDX every once in a while, IDS, IDX alert. That's not using your CRM. Using your CRM is adding in notes. It's coming back to it. It's curating your list. And when you do that, like, that's great. But for me, I do think it's helpful to separate and have, you don't want to hear this, Mr. Mrs. Agent. I want you to have two CRMs. I want you to have your client sales CRM, follow-up boss, line desk, inside real estate's KV Core, whatever that is. Those are people that you're working with um, as potential clients. And it's maybe somebody you're trying to move to potential client. Um, I, ha I use HubSpot CRM for my speaking business, for consulting uh, opportunities, for fractional CMO opportunities, because there's a pipeline. There's a lead. I also use Dex, D-E-X. It's getdex.com. Getdex is one of the very few personal CRMs because Sphere, like I put things in a Dex that there's not a pipeline. If I want to stay connected with people, it's do I just want to stay connected to this person every three months, every six months? I'm going to use it very similar to CRM, but traditional CRMs are built for a pipeline, which means if somebody's not going to be closing a deal, these other type of connections with them don't fit with it. Well, also, traditional CRMs might sync with your email. Dex is going to sync with LinkedIn, Facebook. They're adding in, connecting up with your uh, SMSs as well so that you can pull it up and go, hey, I want to stay in touch with Apollo every three months. And then when I pull it up, it'll tell, show me my last message. It'll connect that automatically. Like they're just built, they're, they're built for a sphere. And then if you were my, if you were um, in my deck area and you started asking questions about property, I might move you over. I do that with people that I'm staying in touch with business and personal index. And when somebody says, Hey, we have an event coming up for our corporations, big, uh, big na uh, international event every year. Would you want to be a keynote speaker? I go put it over in CRM, which also allows other people on my team to see that and pick it up. But normally, I'm not going to give a, a, a salesperson on my, on my personal team. I'm not giving them access to my personal contacts. Those are my personal contacts. Don't go hound my people. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I mentioned a lot on this podcast just how – you know, I think they say you can only really truly maintain about five relationships at one time. And it is very difficult. You, and if you think, if you actually sit back and think about it, like, yeah, actually I'll, I'll forget to text that person back or, you know, these people I'm really focused on talking to right now. So having something like that is great. And there is something nice about separating your personal and business lives too. Yeah. Well, and, and, and even on the business side, it's also just the, there are, there are, there are sales opportunities and then there are people you just wanted to stay in touch with. Um, I, I helped coach. I was uh, with an accelerator out of Georgia Tech, and uh, I'm actually catching up with somebody I haven't spoken to in probably seven years of this same name. Uh, seven years at this time, his name's Piyush. We're catching up today. He's the CEO of another company than than the one he had that was successful when we were talking. And I love Piyush personally. I mean, if we were close, I'd, we'd get together with our friends and family. Um, but I'd say he's much more of a business contact. But since there's no pipeline activity for me and him. I, I couldn't put him in my HubSpot, but yet Dex is allowing me to stay in touch with him and go as I work through and said, hey, I need to make sure I'm touch base with Piyush at least every like six months or so. So we're kicking that off this afternoon when we're touching base. Like, so it is, it's still business, but it's different than like a pipeline or sales opportunity. How long would you say you spend in there on a weekly basis? Not as much as I should. So don't, hey, everyone that's listening, don't feel shame that I triggered something where you're like, oh, <laughs> I, I should be spending more time. I, I don't get it right either. But um, I'd say in the low end, I probably spend 15 to 20 minutes a week um, touching base with decks. 
And sometimes that's not even indexed. It sends me an email every day with LinkedIn title changes from people that I scan. It's probably a 15 second scan to give me a trigger to perhaps reach out to somebody if I see a title change. Um, and then sometimes like if I'm meeting with somebody, like when I'm meeting with Piyush, it gives me a link. So if I click it, it'll open straight up into Dex or straight up into LinkedIn um, so that I can refresh myself on who that person is. So maybe you get another 30 seconds and some contacts there. Um, and then I literally pull up the dashboard just to see, do I have activities there? It's just like a normal CRM. And so that may be another 10 minutes a week on the low side. It may yeah. be as much as an hour to two hours because what I'm trying to get back in the habit that I used to be really good at was whenever I finish a call, I'm adding in margin at the end of the calls, five to seven minutes before my next one to capture notes. Some cases it's just as much as here's what we spoke about. Other cases, it's like, we'll, we'll stay with Piyush as an example. Um, I believe, if I'm correct, I, I'll check my notes, um, but he has two little kids. And so um, that would be in my notes. And so when we talk today, I'm sure he loves talking about his family. When he mentions the ages of them, I will capture that into my DEX account for him. Yeah. So adding a little bit more time. So I probably spend, like I said, 10 to 15 minutes on the low side. It really needs to be about an hour to hour to two hours a week though, um, as more of the facilitation for me doing reach outs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before we wrap up, I want to just get your thoughts on where you think the, the industry is going. You know, one thing that I haven't really heard too much discussion about is a lot of the, you know, the portals that, and I actually don't know how uh, Easy Home Search, what that business model is, but a lot of those are referral based where they're collecting fees at the end of the transaction, if buyer fees, if if what's what we're hearing in the the media is to believe, do start shrinking, and then you might find that across some some kind of uh, buying brackets, but that means that their revenues are going to go down. What kind of shifts do you see the industry making to combat either consumer perception or the reality of what might happen? They, I think buyers. First of all, buyers' commissions may shrink a little, but I mean. I don't think they're, they're going to shrink very much, especially not uh, your, you know, the, for the agents listening, your commissions are not going to shrink if you actually explain your value no. um, to clients. And, and I, to me, that means explaining the different options that they have. Like, do I personally, would I ever sell uh, my, uh, my home on a cash offer basis through the traditional, uh, through the newer iBuyer? Absolutely not. It's like payday loans to me. Like, why would I ever cash my paycheck for 11% less. I, I would yeah. never do that. But it does make sense for people in certain circumstances. And so explaining to people what those options are and then how you differ also is part of the value for you. Things aren't going to shift so much. Um, the percentages are going to shrink some. We also see some uh, perhaps changes with some states where it's possible Zillow might not be able to hand, as an example, may not be able to hand off a lead without having the lead's permission to hand it off to a specific agent and still earn that percentage. That could fundamentally change. That would fundamentally yeah. change things. That's different um, than some of the, the ways it's happening today. Um, but I do think, like, is that even a good model? To me, I, I think if a vetted referral has a huge bit of value, but it all depends on the relationship at that point. And so I, I really like the models where some, a lot of companies are shifting to this. Uh, Easy Home Search is kind of that example where if there's a portal, if there's a lead gen source like that, it's an exclusive relationship or a, or, or a rather exclusive relationship. If you're a mortgage broker who's going to get a lot of leads for, for agents, are you handing those out indiscriminately to people, to agents? No, you have one to five agents that you typically work with. And then they, because you know, they can really help people. They're tightly focused on a niche and, or they're giving you leads back. Well, I, I think that's a better business model for some of these portals. It says, look, we have vetted a local agent or smaller group of agents, um, maybe one for condos versus single family homes. And if you're the agent, you should be looking for somebody like that as well. Because I do think what's really going to happen with consumers is both our buyers, buyers commission is going to shrink. Well, you're going to have to explain your value. I think, and I'm predicting that that's going to happen for portals. The average consumer has no idea that Zillow earns well over a billion dollars, basically selling your information, whether for commission or a thousand dollars a pop to agents. Well, the moment you tell people that they freak out. Well, when buyers agents as a whole start explaining their value and that they protect the data, then people are going to start going, well, Zillow, what do you do with my data over there? Wait a second. You own Trulia too? Like, yeah. and those questions start asking, well, 
then should you even be forgetting whether or not you're an agent you like Zillow? Like at that point, then it's almost a, a bad to say, I protect, I want to protect your data. So I don't work with Zillow. I work differently or I work with this mortgage broker, these exclusive relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly going to be interesting. Um, I have no doubt you will be at the, the forefront of any, any changes. Cause that's just the kind of guy you are. Um, any, anything else you want to sign off with? Where can people find you? What's the, where's the best place to reach out? Uh, LinkedIn uh, is probably the best place to find me, at least for anybody that's interested in business, uh, kind of growth-minded things. My personal website at KurtEuler.com uh, will splinter you out to other things. If you want to see pictures of the mountain property and things, that's a good place for it. Um, and then, hey, you can always go check out EasyHomeSearch.com as well. Uh, like I said, it's, it's one of my favorite ventures I'm looking at right now.